as a cop. Story. Fake and flesh. Copy. Find out. Trace <laughs> Ten seconds there. Stand by. Stand by to roll tape two. In five. Ready, four. Roll tape three. Okay. Two. One. I, I don't consider myself an anchor man. I don't consider myself an actor or a reader. I'm involved in the news gathering process. And at the end of every day at six o'clock, I flap on a little makeup hurriedly, go up to the studio and, and, uh, and tell the folks, hey, here's what happened today in your town. Of course we're performers. The lights, the cameras, we have to be performers. The perfectly knotted tie, the hair in place, the makeup, no slouching to the proper camera. Everything is meticulous. We are performers. Performing a newsman, news person's job. Death threats made against his family. A lot of times I think we sensationalize when there's no substance because sometimes sensationalism sells. And that's for management and the producers to decide, over which, at this point in my career, I don't have a say. Oh, I protest sometimes, and I think they listen sometimes, but it doesn't really change the face of things as I see them. I'm Hodding Carter, and this is Inside Story. Tonight, we talk with three veteran local TV anchormen about the TV news business, where it's been, where it may be going, and what they think about it. It's a business that's changed dramatically since its early days, and they've lived through many of the changes. Inside Story producer Marina Posner begins our story in Miami, where we asked, what's a nice guy like you doing in local TV news? Miami's a good place to be a journalist. It's a community in the midst of change. Once it was principally a winter playground. Now the impact of the drug trade and foreign money, plus a massive influx of foreign refugees, has changed life here dramatically. It's a very different place than it was in 1950, when Miami's first television station began to transmit news to perhaps 2,000 owners of TV sets here. From the Television News Center of the South, here's today's Florida news picture. Canada Dry, America's favorite ginger upper, presents WTBJ's news director, Ralph Rennick, reporting the news. Ralph Rennick was a skinny 22-year-old when he started the news department at WTBJ in 1950. No anchor in America has been on the air without interruption as long as he has. The 11, for now, good night. May the good news be yours. Today, at 56, Rennick is more than just an anchor. He's the station's news director and vice president. This unprecedented power helps insulate him from worries about ratings that haunt most anchormen. I, I don't consider myself an anchor man. I don't consider myself an actor or a reader. Uh, I'm more of a reporter or a reflector of what has gone on in this town every day. I'm involved in the news gathering process. And at the end of every day at 6 o'clock, I slap on a little makeup hurriedly, go up to the studio and, and, uh, and tell the folks, hey, here's what happened today in your town. Ralph Rennick. TVJ's Channel 4 has competition from other stations in Miami now, all of them with serious news departments. But Rennick is the only anchorman who has the power to keep his newscast pretty much as he likes it. Good evening. Eastern Airlines has improved its financial position over last year at this time, but still remains... Some critics think the format is stodgy. There's no young co-anchor, no happy talk. Just a terse half hour of news, sports, weather, and a daily Rennick editorial. Back in the 70s, the station hired TV consultant Frank Magid to liven it up. Rennick called him a Trojan horse and threw out his findings, and the ratings of the 6 p.m. report have remained number one. Channel 4 is the best uh, station you have here in Miami because it's the most known, reliable station, and you find the same person over and over. That helps. One of the most dangerous things that you can do is to go out on the street and ask an American citizen, what do you want to see or hear on your television newscast? They really can't tell you. Or maybe they won't tell you. But the consultants attempt to tell the news department what those interest items are. And uh, there's a big danger in this. Because uh, 
In our case, uh, the consultants say, uh, said, stay clear of City Hall. Those are dull stories. Uh, the budget, the uh, figures, uh, taxes, uh, uh, don't cover minority news. The majority is not interested in that. Uh, your outlying areas and surrounding counties, so, you know, forget that. So if you follow that advice, you're, you really are uh, uh, sitting there and uh, just being a surrogate news director. I think the secret of Ralph Rennick's success is integrity. I just think the man has a tremendous amount of integrity and personal uh, value, and he does a very fine job, and, uh, you know, that just carries a lot of weights, like Walter Cronkite. Who best knows the community? Who best knows what is news in that community? It should be the news director. Now, if the consultant wants to tell you uh, how to build a better set, how to take better advantage of visuals, that's fine. But when you start tampering with the content of the newscast and say no story should be more than a minute and 10 seconds, or you shouldn't cover this or you should cover that, there's a big danger there because the important news, the danger is the important news, things that people should know. Maybe they think they don't want to know about it, but should know about it, will go unreported and uh, we do no longer have an informed public. And unless you have an informed public in this republic, uh, we may find the thing really going down, down the tube. When 30,000 Boy Scouts in our area needed a place to camp, they turned to Ralph Rennick. Through promotion, through longevity, Rennick is everywhere in Miami. The key to his survival is that he's made himself into an institution. There are rumors he may run for public office. He's Mr. Miami, and not coincidentally, it serves WTVJ and Rennick well. I want to say hello, uh, Ralph, Ralph Rennick, how are you? When we were with him, he made an appearance at a public library fundraiser and at a farewell party for the mayor of Nice, France, at the home of a South American millionaire. Then, to top it off, Rennick, a widower who raised six children, offered himself for auction as a dinner date to raise money for a scholarship fund. This is a man who really loves his work. Rennick has done it his own way and made it work. His news program has remained number one longer than any other in the country, multiple awards and all. But he knows who bestows the most important award. The ultimate, uh, I guess the ultimate factor here is the viewer. What the viewer chooses. And uh, I just hope, I just hope that the, uh, the American public, in its great wisdom, We'll be watching what is news and we'll encourage uh, even better news coverage. A lot of times I think we sensationalize when there's no substance because sometimes sensationalism sells. And that's for management and the producers to decide, over which, at this point in my career, I don't have a say. Oh, I protest sometimes and I think they listen sometimes, but it doesn't really change the face of things as I see them. At 62, Los Angeles anchorman Jerry Dunphy is a survivor. He's been through a lot. Six years ago, he underwent quadruple bypass heart surgery. Two years ago, he was bound and robbed in his home. Last year, he and a companion were gunned down in his Rolls Royce in a holdup attempt. Dunphy survived again and returned to the air after three weeks. But to the news community, possibly the most shocking of all was his firing 10 years ago by CBS in L.A., where he was anchoring their top-rated newscast. Too old an image, they felt. KABC News snapped him up the next day. By the next year, it had gone from number three to number one in Los Angeles. While Dunphy would see us, KABC wouldn't let us inside. Perhaps that's because the station's been attacked for years for what's called its flash and trash newscast. Unlike Rennick, who controls show content, Dunphy had to learn to compromise when he joined the KBC news team. And there's a lot of things on television today that, uh, that we wouldn't have put on uh, 10 or 12 years ago. A lot of entertainment information, uh, a lot of uh, little stories that uh, could g easily go without telling, but they have a certain amount of appeal to them uh, whether they're good news stories or not, that's something else. So we've diluted the product somewhat on the way to getting where we are. And uh, sometimes being number one and having something like that succeed 
keeps you keeping on doing it. If we change today and gave the public a 1965 newscast, it wouldn't sell. The public expects more from us today. And we must be giving the public what they want. In television, the public is called the market. In Los Angeles, that market is immense and lucrative. And feeding its taste for news is worth a million dollars per rating point. It's a marketplace where style dominates and where it changes with regularity. A tough market, but for almost a decade, KBC has topped the ratings with what the station itself has described as a combination of journalism and showbiz. Eyewitness News with Jerry Dunphy, Christine Lodge. What KBC gives L.A. is an astonishing three and a half hours of local tabloid-style news. Good afternoon. Here's the latest at four. Homicide detectives in southwest Los Angeles are looking for four killers who carried out a bloodbath early today. The day before we met with Jerry Dunphy, his news opened with five crime stories in a row. It's the editor's choice what goes in and what goes out. And you can't have it all. Hopefully, you will capture the top stories, those that affect the lives of the people the most, those that will show you what it was like in Southern California or a particular community that day. Five crime stories. And I can tell you this, those crime stories you're talking about, I know about, and those are newsworthy stories. Yes, but the, what, a, what a picture of L.A. that gives to your audience. And by leading off a show with five stories about murder and mayhem and bloodbaths as the put it on the air. You're creating a kind of sensational view of the community that breeds a kind of fear in people. And you're ignoring other the stories. the community has a right to be afraid, and rightfully so, should have some fear and should do something to, to, to stop it. And maybe good, strong news stories will make things happen in the legislature, make things happen in our courtrooms that uh, will improve our community. But you're not reporting on the legislature in those newscasts. All the ones I've seen have not covered the legislature. They have not All those you've seen that day, that the, may be true. The city hall. That may be true. But uh, that is not consistently true. So I don't think the point holds weight. We kept watching KBC. This time, the 11 o'clock report with anchor Tawny Schneider, a former Miss America. It opened with three stories about child molestation, followed by a story about a homosexual father and a story on a gay rights bill. Then came three minutes of weather, followed by 56 seconds on Jesse Jackson winning the primary in Washington, D.C., and an equal amount of time reporting on a revival of Leave it to Beaver. We were told Diane Carroll will join the cast of Dynasty, and this was followed by almost six minutes of sports. The next and closing story was about a party at Hugh Hefner's mansion, where the Playmate of the Year was announced. To me, it's better than being Miss America or Miss Universe, and I've always wanted to be either one, but winning the Playmate of the Year title something I've always wanted. My dear, you forget a basic premise. You can do a very successful newscast with all of the right elements and fail. And if you don't respond and be provocative to the audience you've got and you fail, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is there's no substitute like success. If you don't get the rating points, you'll see major changes that can be catastrophic, both to the staffs of stations and to news departments as a whole. You've got to respond to what the public is going to watch. If you're going to get the, if you're going to get the number, ratings are a very real, important part of the business. Now, you don't get the ratings unless you get the audience. And if the audience is inclined to uh, buy that kind of presentation, buy in quotes, uh, turn us on or get turned on by it or whatever it is, you've got to be realistic enough to present it. But what if your audience wants bread and circuses? What if they want porn shows? I mean, how far can you go with pleasing your audience? I suppose as far as good taste allows and what the public will allow. In a sense, they're the censor, aren't they? Oh, I don't know. Are they really? Well, I suppose they are. If, they, if not, they'll turn you off. I mean, if they, they don't want what you've got. But where does your sense of journalism come in and demand certain things be done because they're 